Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our latest program in our Asala Black History Month Festival, celebrating African Americans in the arts. Tonight, we have a fantastic discussion, the impact of the arts in the Gullah Geechee community. Joining us tonight are Dr. Tamara Butler. Dr. Tamara T. Butler is a lover of vintage clothing, cultivator of house plants, and collector of books. As a teacher educator, she draws upon lessons learned growing up on Johns Island, South Carolina. Currently, she serves as the executive director of the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture and associate dean of strategic planning and community engagement for the College of Charleston Libraries. She is joined by Ms. Angel Parsons. Angel Parson is gifted with a natural ability to connect people and ideas with opportunities and outcomes. Angel Parson works to create innovative and effective strategies to promote community development and enhancement. Angel earned her Bachelor of Business Administration and Management and Marketing from Francis Marion University and her Master of Education in Education Administration from Columbia, South Carolina. And thank you all for joining me. And now I would like to welcome Angel Parson and Dr. Tamara Butler. Hello. Hey, y'all. How y'all doing? So I'm assuming that one of the things that we want to kick started about with is thinking about Gullah Geechee uh, culture, heritage, and community. So uh, for us, um, I'm also a commissioner for the Gullah Geechee Corridor. So my one in that role, we're responsible for thinking about um, preserving community, culture, history, and sharing events as well. And so for us, I'm kind of here to offer a little bit of background for folks who have not, um, are not familiar with the Gullah Geechee Corridor and the Gullah Geechee communities. And so we are located, um, our corridor starts, was, it starts north of Wilmington, a few miles north of Wilmington, and goes down the southeast United States coast down to Florida, a few miles south of Jacksonville, and 30 miles inland. Um, in that, it is a national designation. So there's parks, there are historic sites, um, and heritage um, communities and events. And so um, when we think about Gullah Geechee culture and the arts, we really want to think a little bit broader. It's not just the visual arts. I think we're usually familiar with some of our visual artists, but there's also thinking about film, thinking about dance, um, thinking also about sound, and thinking also about literature. So those are just a few things that I think we can start to imagine as we talk about Gullah Geechee communities. Angel, did you want to add anything? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, I, and thank you, Dr. Butler. I'm Angel Parson. I'm the program coordinator here at the Gullah Geechee Corridor. And, you know, when I think about uh, Gullah art, um, I think about the uniqueness of us telling our story in the various ways that Dr. Butler just talked about through music, through dance. Um, that is definitely something that the Gullah Geechee people embody. Um, and that's a lot of what you're going to see kind of exhibited through our art either the ways that we live now or the ways that we that we live through generations. Mm -hmm. So I like to build on this idea of embodiment. So think about embodied technologies. I borrowed that, I think, from Asia May, who is the poet laureate for the city of Charleston. And so just thinking a lot about how we think about rhythms, I really like to think about writing. Um, and then when you just mentioned uh, dance. So we think about the ring shout as an as a spiritual form, but it's also very much an artistic form for those who may have seen it uh, replicated in um, an episode of Queen Sugar. So you see that kind of practice being carried on as a form of resistance, as a form of um, claiming space. So there's that component. And then also thinking about the arts in terms of um, since we're going to go on the Queen Sugar thread, I want to think a little bit about film. So Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust is probably the most prolific um, in highlighting Gullah Geechee culture in the arts form. Uh, it's also, it tickles me a little bit because Gullah, that's when I got introduced to thinking about Gullah Geechee beyond the fact that I'm a Black girl from Johns Island. So when I was an undergrad, my professor was like, have you seen 
Daughters of the Dust, don't you know about this film? And I, and I just kind of looked at him. I was like, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with it. But once you get to see it and see now that it's making this reemergence into the cultural conversation, I think Beyonce's Lemonade made people a little bit more aware of it and want to revisit the film as well. But speaking of Julie Dash and films, you also think broadly about Black women imagining the Sea Islands and the, and the Gullah Geechee Corridor. So I think about Gloria Naylor's uh, Mama Day, where she's thinking about Willow Springs. You have uh, Paul Marshall in Praise Song for the Widow, where she's imagining a connection between um, what's happening in Beaufort in a community called Tatum, and then what's going on in the Caribbean and North Car and um, in New York. Then you also have an, um, Tony K. Bambara ask us to remember Ebo Landing mm -hmm. in her work. So just thinking about how Black women in the 80s and the 90s were really bringing Gullah Geechee community to the forefront of people's minds as like a home place, mm -hmm. as a place of origin for individuals. Um, and then you also have Intezake Shange. Most people know her as a poet. Uh, but she also wrote Sassafras, Cypress, and Indigo, which is looking at three sisters growing up in the corridor. Charleston, the Fusky Island is also included. And so getting people to, to think broadly about what are, how, what do you imagine and what do you remember? Because one of the sisters is also very um, fluent and knowledgeable in plant medicines. Mm -hmm. And so being able to draw on that kind of knowledge and then also the fact that every last one of the sisters are named after some kind of plant or tree, um, indigo dye, indigo being very specific to this, to this area. So just thinking about imaginations through Gullah Geechee communities um, that has been brought to the national attention by Black women writers. Yes. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that because I remember we were thinking a little bit through indigo as an art form as well. Uh, did you want to share anything about indigo dyeing or indigo in its art form? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and so when we look at, uh, like Dr. Butler said, tying in so much of our culture and history and, and elements that are specific to Gullah Geechee, like sassafras plant and indigo, uh, we look at artists such as um, Philip Simmons, who is uh, very well known as a brick mason, iron worker, um, and his work, uh, what, what you see kind of embedded in his work is something called indinkra, indinkra symbols. And indinkra symbols are, are symbols that have different uh, meanings and ideologies that are tied to them um, that kind of speak about the ways of life. And uh, the indinkra symbols actually come from the Akan people uh, living in Ghana, of course, in Africa. So when we think about the ties and in, in uh, those symbols uh, kind of coming over and those philosophies coming over with our ancestors and how they were embedded into our art culture, um, you will see one of uh, Philip Simmons, uh, and he's based out of Charleston, South Carolina, um, and deceased now. So let me put that out there. Um, in the ironwork, in the, the beautiful homes that you see down those cobblestone roads that have um, those gates in front of them, the, our, those iron gates, uh, you will see Sankofa. It's the heart shape kind of in, in embedded in there as a replication of that art form. Um, you're going to see several different indinkra symbols embedded in iron work, but not just in iron work. And, and I kind of got off a little bit as we we're talking about indigo, um, but with those indinkra symbols, we actually see that come through the art form using indigo when they are dyeing clothing. And so um, we have kind of seen this symbology kind of transcend through the, that fa the fashion industry, not even just fashion. Uh, people get uh, indigo. I saw indigo lamps. Uh, some, <laughs> somebody created an indigo lamp, but it had those indinkra stamps, those symbols on, on that indigo. And so when I think about kind of like how we're integrating the arts, that that's kind of what it puts me in the mind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when you're when you're thinking about integrating the art form, you also see it as we've mentioned. So you said woodworking or woodworking, ironworking, indigo. You also see it in our other additional crafts. I think usually in the corridor, people are more familiar with quilts and sweet mm -hmm. grass baskets. Um, and I think what we're finding among this generation is sweetgrass 
is also transitioning. So it's not just baskets, right? So you may see it in jewelry, you may see it in neckwear, you may see it on as bracelets. And so understanding that folks are still trying to find ways to keep, like right now I'm looking at, I have a sweet grass uh, Christmas ornament, it's a bell. So people are still trying to pass on the tradition of making sweet grass, which really is drawing, like we said about indigo, drawing from the earth. Um, and using those, they were once uh, more utilitarian, really in um, central to rice cultivation. But now you're starting to see them not so much in the right cu rice cultivation, but definitely a craft mm -hmm. that continues to share our connection to Africa, um, also our connection to indigenous communities here, as we are all learning how to use bulrush, palm leaves, uh, palmetto, pine straw in order to make these baskets. Same thing with quilting. So quilting, I think we think of the more traditional form um, and artwork in terms of, you know, the kind of just patches and heavy quilts. I have one on my bed. I laugh a little bit because it, it feels like the whatever you put on when you go to get an x-ray, like those aprons. <laughs> and I'm just okay. like how how do you make such a such a, a piece, like a long-standing utilitarian piece? Um with whatever you had, I still don't know what's in between what makes up the bedding, the matting of my of my quilt. But you're starting to see quilting take on all these other, all these forms where it's like uh, it looks like portraits. It uses different patterns. So also understanding, I think we folks have talked a little bit about how messages were embedded in the quilts. And so in this community, you also see quilt makers who are intentionally telling stories through quilts. So it's more, it's less um, symbols and patterns is more very literal translations of people's faces, of scenes, of verses and Bible verses and quotes being woven into quilts now among our quilt makers. And so just thinking about how we can share that through some of our, um, whether it's exhibits, through storytelling, incorporating them in a lot of in presentations as well. So in building on this concept of quilting and storytelling, Mm -hmm. Storytelling is also an art form, whether it's verbal, just thinking about people sharing stories, uh, which we usually see in some of our programming. Um, you also see storytelling in terms of, as I said, with art making. Mm -hmm. You also get storytelling happening in the interpretive work that people are being trained to do within the corridor. So folks who are learning how to tell their own stories or tell our stories. So developing those interpretive principles um, through training so that, you know, Gullah Geechee Corridor uh, residents can actually start to participate in the tourist industry. Absolutely. We'd love to see that continue. So, yeah, just think about programs and initiatives that are helping us do that kind of work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and when you were talking about storytelling, um, you know, that kind of took me back to when we were talking about what is Gullah art and what is so unique about our art is that we use our art to tell to tell these stories. And I remember my mother was telling me that her grandmother gave her a quilt and she was talking about how heavy that quilt was and that she was not able to find one since then. But then also how we pass those quilts down generation to generation. So some folks have their great, great grandmother's you know, quilt that she, you know, made by hand. And we don't even want to take it apart to see what's in it, but whatever is in it, it's still working for us. And it kind of, it made me think about um, as, as, a, as the corridor, as the program coordinator up at the corridor, uh, we have done some different art programs and art workshops to teach people about our cultural tradition. So of course, the Sweetgrass demo and, um, and teaching people about um, you know, how they had to go and pick, pick up, you know, pick the the materials for that, because often what we created was what we had, you know, what what mm -hmm. the land had to provide to us to do that. And many of us are still doing that today. Uh, we did a Gullah Dolls workshop, which mostly talked about using what we had to create um, what we wanted or needed, but also utilizing that Gullah doll to tell a story. And so that presenter, uh, Ms. Zenobia Harper over at Joyner Institute at Coastal Carolina, she came and presented and she said, you know, we use bottles and we use grass to make our dolls. You know, we didn't have the money to go out and buy the dolls. We had to use the scraps in, in so much of what we had. And so I think about that when I think about our artists, when we think about visual arts, uh, Sam Doyle, who is from St. Helena Island, uh, in South Carolina, he was an artist, but he did colorful paintings on sheet metal and on wood, 
right? So we just kind of utilize whatever we could to tell our stories and to kind of pass that uh, pass that art form down. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking when you said people who are using what we have, I think about Hank Herring, um, who intentionally uses found found objects in his work. Um, but on top of that, he's a wood. He's he would say he's not an artist. He likes like I'm just you know I just make stuff. <laughs> and I'm like uh, I can't make half of these things. So he, thinking about woodworking with Hank Herring, um, most of it. So we had an exhibit here that was shared. Um, really brought the artist brought to our attention by the corridor. Um, and having his exhibit here and having a workshop as well, where we had community members come in um, and kind of think about the Adinkra symbols and which were included in some of his artwork, but also the challenges and and the uh, very intentionality that intense that you have to have in order to engage in such a practice. Absolutely. So, so we try our best when you talk about using what you have. I just remember that that was his, how we can take things from the past that we think should be discarded or may not have a use and reclaiming. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, with that, it just makes me think of something that I know people who my newest uh, train of, of work has been around Black ecologies and Black geographies. And so when I think about that, I think that Gullah Geechee folks really are lead leading the way and taking the charge through their art form as a way of reclaiming things. Mm -hmm. So that we've, we, you know, we're kind of like at the, at the forefront or should be at the forefront of like environmental justice work. You know, we're doing, it's not just about recycling, but we've always been upcycling. We've always been taking the discarded pieces, whether we look at the scraps on the table or we look at the pieces of cloth to make quilts. Um, we're always trying to find ways to tell new stories through mm -hmm. what is old. So I always find that to be very powerful um, in a place like the corridor. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And, you know, one of the things that um, we kind of wanted to chat about is how is the corridor, uh, the work that we're doing to preserve uh, the art forms in the Gullah Geechee culture. And uh, we're grateful. Uh, Avery Research Center is one of our wonderful partners uh, that we do programs with in the Charleston area um, and even beyond, actually. Um, so we take some of what we do with, with Avery and, and, uh, and other organizations and kind of rework it from state to state because the stories are so similar. Uh, and so some of, the, um, some of the programs that we've done, we've hosted an exhibit uh, that was called The Water Brought Us. And that kind of tells the story of the Gullah Geechee people uh, through mostly visual arts. So we work with different uh, Gullah Geechee artists across the corridor and their um, paintings were involved in that exhibit. We hosted some art talks with some of the artists. Uh, Mary Ferris, if, if you are anywhere in the Beaufort County area and even beyond in Charleston, he is doing public art um, exhibits where he is putting our culture on the walls in, in big open spaces that the community can see, beautiful, colorful paintings. So he was an artist. We also had the artwork of Sam Doyle as well, who has passed on. Um, and of course, uh, Jonathan Green, who is a renowned Gullah Geechee artist and has really, really led the way um, as it relates to Gullah art and kind of making that an, an international um international exhibit of our culture and our heritage. And I even just saw where he is having another edition of uh, Art Off the Wall with Jonathan Green, where the there will be um, dancers, right? And so this is, it's happened several times, but it's been a few years, but being able to see them, you know, take his artwork and then turn that into a dance form to tell our story. And so I, I, I appreciate um, elements like that and being able to be involved with artists like that. Uh, but the artist of his caliber, he's working with us and allowing us to use his very vivid paintings that really tell the story of uh, our culture, our ways of life, right? Church scenes, um, scenes that, of people at the market, uh, families gathering, you know, just things that really tell our story. And we're able to use that in our marketing pieces uh, as the Gullah Geechee Corridor, as we are trying to kind of spread uh, more about who we are. And so um, that exhibit went to three different, four different locations um, across North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, and again, like I said, we were able to have talks with the artists. We were able to have talks about maritime culture, right? Our ties to the waterways, 
through those paintings. Um, and so it just allows us the opportunity to kind of tell the full story of, of who we are. And we're still discovering. I think that's what I like about the work as well. As much as we do the education and preservation, uh, we're also working in that interpretation space because some folks are still finding out that they're Gullah Geechee. But I want to let you know that if you are African-American, and if you are, are doing that genealogy and tracing, your grandma, your granddad is from Georgia or Charleston or whatever, uh, you're, you, you're Gullah Geechee. You are Gullah Geechee. So we want more of our community to embrace that so that you can have the opportunity to kind of learn uh, more. Um, we talked about kind of art in the arsenal. So we did woodworking uh, with Avery. We've done the Indankra stamping. Uh, we've done sweet grass, but we're even extending that. Um, as we talk about art forms, I don't want to leave out uh, what we call like that mixed media art. Uh, so doing something in photojournalism and tell, because we tell our story really through images, uh, through images, we are going back and finding different images that kind of place us. We're able to see the clothes that they were wearing, you know, the structures and the homes that they were living in to really kind of give us a little bit of an understanding of what life was like um, at that point. So yeah, are in the arsenal, some faith-based programs, but we also support festivals uh, all across the corridor. And like Dr. Butler said, at those festivals, you're going to see Gullah Geechee performers. Uh, you're going to see the McIntosh County ring shouters and the Geechee Gullah ring shouters out of Georgia uh, performing that ring shout, which is like a praise break uh, where folks move around in a circle, they clap their hands and they stump their feet. So if you AME or Baptist or Pentecostal, you probably engage in a bit of a range <laughs> at one point or another. So it's just teaching people um, those connections so that they can embrace uh, the culture more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's the dynamic parts of thinking about your programming. You know, I think about being able to see a ring shout live, like in and know that families, for example, like the Macintosh singers where they are, Macintosh shouters where they are actually they've passed it on through generations because there is there is a, a specificity to it. It's about a movement. It's about a rhythm. It's about, you know, feet can, feet really shouldn't be lifting up off the ground. So I love that in the sense of um, it's still, it's an art form, mm -hmm. right? And so reminding people when you do see the, when you do see um, variations of it in public, it's like, it has an origin. Right, the ring shot has an origin, and it is dance. It is a form of dance, um, and it also is a form of it's a it's connected to music, but it is also a form of storytelling, in itself to be able to participate in that in that act with people. Um, the songs that are being sung at that time are they all are about storytelling, and being able to see that, for example, I like the Freedom's Eve programming, is dynamic to me, um, but and also being able to have the sounds. So yeah. thinking about people singing, the storytelling being able to hear about communities, um, African-American settlement communities within the corridor who have reclaimed and are promoting their history. That's really the, the beauty of, I think the arts give you a chance to, to have a platform to celebrate folks. And so in, the, in this community, another form of celebration, you were talking about artists earlier, I just wanted to bring into the room Natalie Days. She's not literally gonna show up on the screen, y'all, sorry. Um, but I wanted to bring her in the room and that her artwork intentionally incorporates these kind of elements that we find in the corridor. So she has an art piece that actually has rice in the artwork. Um, she also has a Sweetgrass series where she has uh, turned some of our more famous um, and celebrated Gullah Geechee corridor residents or Gullah Geechee folks into saints. So there's Saint Septima, who has a, a Sweetgrass halo. Then she also has like a collard green series where she's painted a variety of people, not just not just women, but also men, um, either holding or wearing or fashioned into um, in using greens as fashion. And so I think that's important because once again, it goes back to finding these things that sustain and tell a story. Um, the connection to Freedom's Eve for me is, you know, usually during New Year's, you eat collard greens and you eat Hoppin' John. Y'all can fight me on whether or not it's black eyed peas and my family, we eat cow peas. So I'm just saying cow peas and field peas, but they have right. the same representation <laughs> of, of prosperity, um, of good luck and hope and, 
and all positive things into the new year. And so I think that that's also being able to share that in an art form to remind people that A, these things have sustained us. A, this is how we celebrate one another and think about the richness of, of our culture and of our people. So Freedom Z for me is, is one of my favorites because it's a chance to see and connect with so many folks across the corridor, whether in your state or if you travel to another state to attend their Freedom's Eve. I think it's a really beautiful um, artistic celebration of like, where have we, what have we come through mm -hmm. and what is, and what are we continuing to dream and share uh, through music and dance and art in our communities? Absolutely, absolutely. And and I and, and what I what I love about the Freedoms E program and even our Gullah Geechee uh, cord, a heritage corridor celebration that we do every October, um, <laughs> put a little pin in that, um, yep. is it also gives us an opportunity to uplift uh, the culture keepers, uplift these Gullah Geechee performers who have, um, and not just the performers but also the artisans um, who have taken the time to learn about the culture, who have taken the time to listen to Big Mama and listen to Granddaddy and, and actually pick up um, some of those traditions and carry them on so that they can be preserved through generations. Um, and that's one of the major things that we are trying to do and working to do in the corridor is increase the tourism, um, but you increase the tourism through increasing, uh, well, increasing the opportunities for those culture keepers and the people that are doing the work to actually um, get an audience and have an audience come and learn more about the culture through their work. Um, and it's definitely something that we want to promote, especially uh, with those that are using their hands as well, right? So your woodworkers, um, your iron workers, um, your brick masons, right? But, but even, um, your construction workers. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing that I love about um, about our culture, what I'm learning is we've always used our hands. We have always mm -hmm. worked with our hands. We are the builders. Uh, we are the crafters. We are the creators um, in, in how we have influenced, how our art forms, how our hands have really influenced um, things that have become American culture. When I think about mm -hmm. the front porch, a lot of people don't know that the front porch is actually um, a creation. It was the cooling porch. It was built. Um, really, it's a it's a African tradition, right? It was it it was established in Africa and then brought over to America. So all of y'all that sit on your front porch cooling now know that um, your your ancestors created that. I mean, it is something, like I said, that has become a part of American culture. Like everybody wants a front porch now, but it was something that was introduced and they built that with their hands. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when I when I think about our innovation um, and all the things that we are not credited for, but now we're living in this new society, right? This new world where there is an opportunity for you to uh, be an entrepreneur and it's opportunity for you to get your work out there while also um, preserving your culture and your heritage and not letting somebody come in and co-op that from you. So I, I do appreciate um, the innovation of our art. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to backtrack a little bit to something you said about using your hands. I think when we look at the corridor and when we think of Gullah Geechee communities, we usually, we think very rural um, and we think very land literal um, but knowing Gullah Geechee folks are also urban, <laughs> we're also in cities, um, and we're also responsible for building cities. So just kind of look, as you look around at architecture, so what, for usually we think ironwork and gates, you can also look at the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, I think about buildings throughout the corridor that have been built from reclaimed shipwreck or reclaimed wood or, you know, or bricks that were built by hand. It's like really thinking about the intentionality of of our structures mm -hmm. and the beauty of them as a form of preserving the arts. So in preserving the arts, it's like thinking about the windows, it's thinking about the actual, um, we think a lot about the praise houses that are still here. That's still a preservation of art, not just what happens within them, the right. singing, the worship, the education, but also the structure itself and the work to get it on register, on you know historic registers, uh, national registers, local, and then also making sure that people know what they are. 
so yeah. that they're not demolished. So that's part of preser preserving the art is also preserving the building itself um, and bringing attention to those buildings that are important to us um, as Gullah Geechee folks. And so thinking about churches, schools, places of worship, um, places of gathering, burial grounds, like all of those, when we think of preserving the arts, we really need to think, as you said, about the ingenuity, the innovation, the overall creativity that's all around us and knowing that I don't know if we intentionally set out to do certain things. Like, so I don't know if everything was like, oh, I'm going to make this and this is going to be a visual art piece that goes in a museum right. as much as it is. I'm making this thing that I know will tell a story long beyond me. And that's the goal of all that we're doing um, in this region is to be able to create something that will extend way beyond us because it's made it to this generation because somebody made that commitment. And so my hope is that um, through the corridor and beyond that people will come in and, and really participate in the programming, not just as um, an observer, but get active, right? Like get in there when you can, when you're invited to do so, participate, learn, listen, um, the way that we speak is very much a language and that's an art form in and of itself. I know in the academic mind of me, people are like, now you're saying everything is an art, but it is, it is. you know, when you get up in the morning to get dressed, that's an art, right? <laughs> <laughs> like you got something to say, you get, you dress very intentionally. Mm -hmm. And I think in this community, we see it when I think about, you mentioned earlier, uh, clothing, you also see it in the kind of rise in folks in the corridor who are building clothing lines, who are using it to infuse whether it's um, all kind of iconography. So whether it's the sweetgrass symbol, whether it's the palmetto leaves, mm -hmm. whether it's the intentional dyeing, the storytelling that we see through, uh, oh, through jackets and other, and other ways that we've kind of brought the archives into the clothing we wear. I think it's, it's just important to understand that preservation of the arts at the end of the day is a preservation of ourselves and our storytelling and our memories. And so any way that we can do a way to like honor our ancestors and make sure that they're always in the, that people recognize they're always in the room with us, whether it's the clothes we wear, the songs we sing, mm -hmm. um, that, that all of that is a part of who we are. Gullah Geechee folks, and I say this, I think that applies to most black people, but Gullah Geechee folks really show up in a room by themselves. Um, and so we, we always want to make sure that our, our artistic expressions, um, remind us of those people mm -hmm. and that, and of those who taught us all of these different forms of expressing who we are. Yes. I, <laughs> say, I think that you, you just wrapped it up. You just tied it up. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. That was, yes. Yes. Well, I was I was also wondering if you could tell us a little bit more. Um, do you all do any programmings with ancestors and thinking about musical forms? Absolutely, absolutely. So we <laughs> so we actually have an upcoming program called Awakening of the Ancestors through Music, um, and much like um, and not much like Freedom's Eve because this this actual program was birthed. Um, out of our Freedoms E program in preparation for January 1 and, and is celebrating that cultural tradition. And so we have been doing this program now uh, for about five years with the International African American Museum. And every year we have a different culture keeper come and share a different part of our traditions. Uh, so last year we did highlight language because like you said, it is an art form. Uh, this year, we're going to have uh, Ron and Natalie Days and uh, Sarah Days come. And we are highlighting our theme this year is about uh, we are what our ancestors dreamed and looking a little bit deeper into that dream. And much like Dr. Butler was saying, um, that it, it, it's who we are. So now it's just about how you're going to allow that to kind of show up. Uh, for you and uh, how you're going to allow yourself to show up in the space and in the culture as it relates to preservation uh, through your own hands. So we are really excited about Awakening of the Ancestors um, because it's something that we always need to keep in front of us, uh, you know, what they went through, but also what they built through. 
uh, because no matter what, we were always creating when there was something that came up against us, we found a different way. So always, um, you know, just being forward thinking and thinking about the future. And so, yes, Awakening of the Ancestors. I love that program. Thank you for bringing that one up. Um, and it is, it is a musical. It is a wonderful musical program. And you will see at many of the events and programs that we have, we always bring that element of music in the room because it is a universal love language, um, but it's also a universal way to tell stories. Uh, and so we do use that mechanism. Absolutely. I love it. Well, I was going to say thank you so much for once again to the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History for the invitation. I want to thank Angel Parson because it's always a pleasure to be in conversation. Uh, with the indomitable uh, Angel Parson, because the programming is phenomenal. And, I, and I'm hoping that community members and those watching will find the programming nearest to you, um, attend, jump in, but they will also think about attending programming when they're, that might not be virtual, but also in person. And also just really thinking about what does it mean to engage the arts? Remember that it's embodied. Right. Remember that it's it's passed on um, and that what you're what you're witnessing is just another iteration of creativity that is like generations down the road. It's like playing telephone. So it's it's like, well, where are we now? Like what iteration is this? And it's it's dynamic. You're watching so much of people really trying to preserve um, art forms and stories. Through, through our practices. Absolutely. So thank you once again for the invitation. Thank you. And, you know, I'm really, I was sitting here watching you all speak. And one of the things that popped into my head, uh, Angel, you mentioned that if your family is from Florida or Georgia or South Carolina, you're probably Gullah Geechee. And I was thinking about, I did uh, genealogy for my family and they're all from Florida on my mom's side. I said, oh, these folks are from Florida. So as you said that, it popped into my mind. I said, well, hey, maybe, maybe they are. <laughs> so I'll have to you stop are. through. Exactly. <laughs> and learn. Maybe I am. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, this was an amazing conversation. And thank you so much for participating in our virtual Black History Month Festival. And for those of you watching, learn more about the Gullah Geechee Corridor by visiting GullahGeecheeCorridor.org. I'm going to leave it up for a second, but if you don't catch it, pause the video or look at it in the description. But please visit their site and learn more about the Gullah Geechee Corridor, the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Let me get the name right. <laughs> and so before we end our program, I just want to give a special thanks to our 2024 sponsors. We could not have our Black History Month Festival or our returning Black History Month luncheon without the support of our 2024 sponsors. So thank you so much for your support. And thank you all for watching and have a great night. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Butler.